Welcome to Desi Plaza TV. Today, under the guest section, we have Mr. Mike Gauss, who is a thinker, speaker, organizer, has done a lot of community work, and has been involved in community for so many years. Mike will tell us today about himself, his life, and his efforts bringing the community together. Welcome to Desi Plaza TV, Mr. Mike. Well, thank you very much, Manohar. I'm very pleased to be here, and I, I want to appreciate the efforts Desi Plaza TV is making to put together a profiles of different people in the community who have done some work, and also to narrate a story of us Desi people, uh, so the future generation can see our history on the videotape. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Mr. Mike, tell me something about uh, yourself, from where you are, how have you been uh, brought up, and what is the inspiration of what you are today? That's a lot of questions, Manohar, but I will answer them. I was born and raised in Elahanka, a suburb of Bangalore, India. I was born on a very auspicious day, in one of the most beautiful days for the Republic of India. It was the Republic Day on January 26, 1953. I was born that day and uh, my father was also a councillor of the town of El Hanka. He was a mayor when I was born. And it's become a very auspicious day for me. I had a good grounding and I come from a background of inheriting India's richness. Richness, what we're going to talk about, the pluralistic ethos that is learning to live with each other's differences that has been our history for nearly 5,000 years. And uh, I'm very pleased that I was born. I'm very proud that I'm an Indian and I bring that heritage to America and I hope to add, contribute to enrich our society here in America with my Indian heritage, our uh, values from there. Thanks for asking me that question. I grew up in Alanka. I was there until 1977 and uh, uh, it, it was quite a rich experience uh, throughout my life the foundation my parents gave me is very important I want to share a few small things uh, when I was growing up about high school I need to place the time for that maybe around 14 to 16 years old I was going to the bhajan mandir every Friday mosque I used to go then right in front of my house across the street there was a bhajan mandir and every Friday evening I used to do the bhajans. On Thursdays there was a Mahabodhi society where I learned a whole lot about Buddha. And my close friend was a Jain and my mother's close friend was a Parsi and our neighbors were Christians. So I'm very proud and privileged that I was able to connect and relate with each one of them and that way uh, all of that has come into me and uh, my father taught us without any barriers. We grew up with no barriers. Even my sister, even after this many years, we are very reluctant to say we have Hindu friends. We are friends. Religion is secondary. So, but that's how we grew up in India. And uh, way back, uh, that's part of the growth. And uh, in the college days, my teacher, Mr. A. Ramachandra, who I always remember and admire, my English teacher, uh, he was a huge Sai Baba Bhagat. And um, he and one of my friends, he used to be Saris. He was very intellectual on Islam. So the three of us used to get together and talk about interfaith dialogue. In my home also, we had uh, Mr. Hussein used to come. He was a Shia Muslim. And uh, we were raised with no distinction of any religion. So my, my grandfather and him used to talk about that. We learned how to conduct a civil dialogue. Accepting the difference, that's our heritage in India. Uh, you and I may have different opinions, but still we accept the differences and carry on a very civil dialogue. So those were the upbringing things. Uh, I also want to share, uh, I, I think it is a very important uh, it has shaped my life. Uh, remember in India there used to be communal riots we call where Hindus and Muslims and Muslims and Hindus, Christians, every now and then there will be some friction. Uh, so was with Tamil and Canada 
or Kerala and Telugu. And I remember when M. T. Ram Rao's picture came up, life science pictures. And whereas Rajkumars were done, then there were fights. So we always have issues that we fight about. We give different labels. So during this communal riots, a few Hindus and a few Muslims were killed. Uh, it was a shameful thing. But this is the lesson my dad taught me to the whole family. He would gather all of us and he would say, look, this communal riot has killed two or three Hindu family members and Muslims. Their families are widowed, they were their wives, their children have become orphans. Who's going to take care of them? And he never, he taught us, he never blamed Hindus or Muslims. He always went to that, let's say use the name Ram or Rahim. He said, if that Ram guy had not started this little fight, nothing would have happened. Or he would say, if Rahim had not fought back and made the fight bigger, none of this would have happened. Their families would have been safe. Then he would say, people have a habit of blaming religion. He says, religion is an intangible thing. You can't touch, you can't feel, you can't smell. You can't see. It's intangible. So, he said, in case like that communal riot, if you find the guys who have done wrong, find it, take them to the court and do the right thing, do the justice. Justice is done, problem is solved, and people feel good about it. Nobody is apprehensive of each other again. Whereas if you blame Hinduism or Islam, it's like barking in the darkness. No problem is solved problem is continuous. So uh, when did you uh, come to United States? I came in 1980. Mm -hmm. I was working in Saudi Arabia. That's where my name Mike comes from. I was working in Saudi Arabia uh, in 1977. My father passed away and uh, I wish he was alive so I wanted to do things for him. I couldn't. So during that time, I was in Saudi Arabia. I was a chief accountant for Fluor Corporation, one of the largest petrochemical engineering company. My friend, he worked, he was, he worked for me at one time. Uh, he is 96 years old. He's, he lives in Richardson, Everett Blauvelt. He and I were talking every day and uh, uh, when my father passed away, he was a very good fatherly figure to me. He was always inquiring about my mother, my things, how things are going. So we became very close. Then I had always wanted to come to the United States. I read Dale Carnegie's book, How People Interact, and I had this dream of coming, but never seriously thought about coming here. So Mr. Blauvelt, Everett Blauvelt, I call him Dadsky, he said, you need to come to the States. I didn't pay attention, I just let it go. One day, I think sometimes in, I don't remember, sometimes in 78, he said, you need to go to the U.S. consulate in Tehran. And I said, what for? He said, just go there. I go there. They had my passport stamped. And he said, you go, go stay in my house and do what you need to do. And then I joined the University of Dallas. Uh, so he called me affectionately Mike. And... Uh, way back in Saudi, I didn't change the name here in Saudi Arabia. So when I became a citizen here, I kept that name for me, Mike. And uh, th that's how my name came. And uh, it's an honor to him for giving me that name. And ever since he lived in Richardson, I came to Richardson. I lived my first 12 or 13 years of my life in Richardson, maybe 14 years, actually 16 years in Richardson. And then I moved uh, to other places. Tell me something, how you got involved with the Desi community? I guess everyone has a story to tell. In uh, 1993, uh, my wife at that time and I went through a friendly divorce. And um, uh, at that time, I wanted to get out and meet people. One of my friends, Vinod Mathur. Hi Vinod. Vinod Mathur, he said, what, I used to take care of his business. He said, why don't you join India Association? So that was the first time I learned about India Association and I joined India Association. 
Then I wanted to go learn about what's going on in our community. There was no medium to connect those Indians at that time. There were not that many Indians at that time. Probably six to seven thousand maybe, uh, somewhere near there. So I joined the India Association and then was looking for a medium for us to connect. There was a, then there was a friend who said, why don't you start a paper? So I started the paper called Asian News. It was in 1993. And my focus on the paper was about all the Desi communities, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. And then the news about the events, what's going on at the Hindu temple, uh, the DFW Hindu temple was built then. What's going on at the mosque, or what's going on at the Indian Christian churches, or the Zoroastrians, we have about 50 families in Dallas, with the Jain community. So I started putting all those things together. That is even before Suleika or uh, Eknazur and other sites came up. So that became a center, focal point for the entire Desi community to look into it and come together, get to know, go to the events and the events were coming and uh, that's how I got involved in the community. Then two years later, we had a Desi TV. Uh, that was the first Desi TV. Shabna Margil, myself, uh, we started the, uh, uh, another friend of us, I'm losing his name. So my friends, um, Shabna Margil, Shiraz Mitani and myself, we started a program called Desi TV. It ran for about six months. It was a good effort at what you were doing. We brought all the stories. Then we, somebody approached me to do a radio program. And that was the first commercial. India Association always had it, but Radio Bharti has always been there. But we started a program for the kind of a business like. Uh, we started on Saturdays for three hours. Even there, Manohar, we started doing uh, like the events. Every Saturday for about 15 minutes, whatever festival that day, whether it's Srinam Nami, Janamashtami, Milad, Muharram, or uh, Pariyushan, whatever festival that week, we compacted them in the 15 minutes. If there was only one festival, we talked about that festival. From there, the pluralism grew so people can learn about different festivals. As an Indian, I'm embarrassed if, of course I do know, I would be embarrassed if my neighbors are Muslims, I don't know their festivals, anything about it. What I learned is not the right thing. Or if my neighbors are Hindus, I don't know what Jarmasini or Ram Noami, that's, I cannot probably tell I'm an Indian, I know everything. I don't. I don't know my neighbors. So this program helped many people and get that. We also had a program called uh, Wisdom of Religion, where for two years, every morning 6 to 7 on 11.50 a.m., Monday through Friday, five days a week, one hour, every religion, with no exception, from including atheism, atheism to Zoroastrianism, and everyone in between, one hour. Uh, it was not about the theology, it is not how you worship, but what does it mean to a common person on the street? What does Jesus said, follow me means? What does when Krishna says, surrender to me? Or Allah says, submit to my will. What does it mean to a common person who is not conditioned with a religion? Or who is not a Hindu or a Muslim or a Jain or a Christian? So with that idea, we did the educational program. And I did some workshops on religion called understanding atheism all the way to understanding Zoroastrianism. At the end of the program, we gave a certification that you are a pluralist, meaning you have a good knowledge about every religion. And we need to. As people living in this society, or India, these are the only two places in the whole universe, England plus England, where you have people from every faith living together. And we need to know each other so we can have a better life for all of us. So pluralism has its beginning in 1996, I believe. I knew everybody at the Thanksgiving Square here in Dallas. In Thanksgiving Square, I wanted to join uh, become a member. Uh, I remember at, uh, I was a pluralist, also I was an atheist. I did not follow any religion all the way until just two years before 9-11. I didn't follow any religion, but I was in every religion. So I wanted to apply for membership at Thanksgiving Square. They denied it because I was not a Muslim, Hindu, or atheist or something. Uh, they didn't have a room for atheists, so I was not. That is a heck with it. 
We want to create an organization that embraces everyone regardless of their belief. So the pluralism came from there. And uh, at that time many people even could not pronounce the word pluralism. But India is all about pluralism. Indian society is about pluralism. So we created this uh, foundation for pluralism and we have been doing lots of programs to bring all Americans together regardless of our faith, ethnicity, race, we all want to come together to create a very secure and safe America for all of us. Uh, earlier you mentioned that uh, there was a small incident in your life, uh, in your brother's office, uh, that made you think, can you tell me something about that? Sure. I love my mother and my father for giving these pluralistic values. Uh, my, my brother Farooq has a real estate business in Bangalore. and. Uh, his, uh, his manager was, uh, I don't even want to say a religion, but he was a Hindu and his name was also Krishna. And one day Krishna, being a manager, put up a picture of Lord Krishna on the wall. And he got a little panicky, he didn't know what to do with it. So he goes to mother, say, mother, uh, my manager has put Lord Krishna's picture on the wall, what do I do? The first thing my mother asked, do you have? a picture frame of Allah, Muhammad, or any of your religious thing. He says, say, I have a name of Allah on the wall. So that solves it. She said, you have yours? He has his. What's the problem? And my, father, my brother was very happy. And when I was told this story years later, I was just thrilled Said, this is a beautiful teaching that we have. You follow your religion, I follow my religion. Why should it be a problem? On that note, I want to share a few more things about pluralism on earth. God has created all of us to be diverse, intentionally diverse. Meaning, you look at this, everything, uh, Bhagavad Gita says, no blade of grass is alike. And we hear the expression, no two snowflakes are alike. If you look at, in October of last year, we were 7 billion people on this earth. Each one has a different thumbprint. No two thumbprints are alike. Maybe it's a rarity. Our eye print is different. And of the seven billion we are, each one has a different DNA makeup. So this is God's intention for us to be different and unique. Our taste buds, in your own family, Manor, your mother cooked the food. You and your sister, although you ate from the same food but you developed a different taste bud. You may take more salt or you may have more pickle, she may take less. Each one has a different taste bud that is also unique. So what pluralism is learning to accept the otherness of other. You don't have to be like me. God has created you to be a very unique being. Respecting your uniqueness is respecting the creator. For example we have race wise we have the African Americans, we guys, the brown guys, the Caucasians, and the Chinese. It's God's intention to create us this way. If I look down upon a yeah, Caucasian, or African American, or Chinese less than me, I'm not being respectful to the Creator who created all of us. To be respectful to the Creator, we have to respect everything that He has created. So we need to take this, ex extend this acceptance of the other to religion also. You and I can believe differently, so what? We can live with it. You can worship here the way you want to worship, I can worship mine. How is it affecting you and I? If I eat, let me ask you this question, this is a good question. Between gulab jamun and jalebi, what is your preference? If I say manohar, you got a choice, you pick gulab jamun or jalebi? Both are sweet, so I can pick any. Now tell me, which is your favorite? Only one? Yeah, it will be gulab jamun. Gulab jamun. Now let's say your sister picks jalebi. Mm -hmm. If you bring a dietitian, a research scientist like Krishna, or a doctor, or a food connoisseur, and if he comes and tells Manohar, gulab jamun doesn't taste good, jalebi tastes better, or Mysore Park tastes better, what do you say? <laughs> hey, I'll enjoy this food. 
This is my favorite. So like that, religion is the same way. What you consume, Gulab Jamun gives you the joy. You are taste, but Gulab Jamun in itself is not better than Jalebi. It is what your taste bud is conditioned to connect with. That's why you like that. And your sister may like jalebi because that's how her taste bud connects with it. Religion is no different. Religion is what you are conditioned to grow up with or you choose to accept. So it is your religion. It's like your taste bud. It is your gulab jamun, your peach cobbler in American terms. So if you can learn to respect that, I have no problems if you eat jalebi. jalebi or Bhatshai or whatever that thing is and you have no problem with what I eat you have no problem if you eat thick dal or chana dal <laughs> or lamb or fish curry, it doesn't matter to me yeah. so religion should be the same way there are some people who both in all religions, Hinduism, Islam, Christian, Judaism there are a few who do not understand religion and they are the ones who since they don't understand religion, they're insecure. They think if everybody has to believe what they have to believe, they think everybody has to eat gulab jamun. And that's not how God has created. And uh, I can proudly say, God will never, never let Hinduism become the religion of the world. Christianity will not be the world religion of the world. Neither Islam. Everyone will have their share throughout. Everyone will exist because that's how God has created. Pluralism is learning to accept that. It's God's intention. We didn't create the religion. It came through God and through our sages, saints, they brought this goodness for us. What is religion? Religion, let's say for example, don't ask an imam, don't ask a pundit, don't ask a clergy. Ask somebody, let's say Mr. Spock, you know the Star Wars movies. Let's say Mr. Spock comes, or somebody from Russia before they break up they have no idea what religion is they have no, no idea even what God is so what they do uh, they evaluate like uh, if you evaluate different software systems which one functions best for a given uh, application they would evaluate religion actually I had a lady from Russia that I interviewed on the radio way back in 90 whatever time and she said, when Russia opened up, they opened up for people to come and sell religion. I'm using the word sell in really that sense. So she says, there were tables in a big hall, like an exhibition. There was an Islam booth, there was a Christian booth, there was a Hindu, Buddhist booth, a Baha'i booth. Each one was selling that their religion was better. And he, she said it was funny. Because you're selling a product that is intangible, you don't see it, you're just selling your value. Listening to each one of them, she said, as a person with no conditioning of prior religion, to me all of them sounded exactly alike. She said, Islam, Hinduism, Baha'i, the bottom line is, there is a book of guidance to everybody. There is, everybody believes in God in one form or the other. And everybody does a thing called prayer, every religion. And in the prayer, people bow, lean, prostrate, all things. He, she said that is pure humility that religions are teaching. Then she says, when looking at all of them, the bottom line is, when, my, when your loved one dies, you are afraid, you don't understand. If somebody does hit, hurt your family member, how are you going to get even with it? You don't know. So those fears and phobias and anxieties rest in us. And then she says that religion, whether it is Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, I, they help you find peace within yourself. They release you, they find moksha for you, they find nirvana for you, they find mukti for you. And when you do that, you feel in command. In, when you are angry, when you are upset, you are not you, you don't know what you are doing. But when you bring it together, religion, it makes, then it also tells you how to live with others. And that's what religion is about.
Uh, you have been featured in a lot of uh, prime time channels. Can you tell something about those? Well, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I since I, st I was uh, started with TV way back in 19, I think 95 or 96. Uh, 911. Uh, no, prior to that, Oklahoma bombing in 1992, at about that time, not 92, something around 94. Uh, when that happened, all the TV cameras converged on the mosque. So I was there, and uh, they interviewed me. When it comes 9-11, they interviewed me. Every channel was there. CNN ran a 30-minute story on it, and literally every channel was doing the coverage. And um, all my friends, my friends, this friend said, you did good. You told what needs to be told. You said, you summarized everything together. And uh, that's how I was. And I, again, uh, I must say that I was the first Desi radio talk show host in Dallas, maybe, maybe in the, in the United States, because most of the Desi videos were songs. Ours was the first talk, sh talk show radio we talked about every issues. So I had this background of writing in the newspaper, then doing a talk show, having, uh, and they, when they had the Pokhran blast in India and Pakistan, we had a few Pakistani leaders, a few Indian leaders uh, sit down and discuss the effects, the sanctions that uh, US had placed on both the countries, how did we deal with it? So I have quite an extensive background in that. Then I had the background on the television, and I have been writing. It bothers me when you see, again, it's not only Indians, American people, they don't know a whole lot about other people. So this desire for promoting knowledge, education, being a teacher to everyone, if you are angry at me, be angry at me if I've done something wrong to you personally, not because the way I look or the way I talk, so from that idea, the pluralism developed, and I'm very pleased. Uh, I was on NPR uh, many times, and I was also on uh, t uh, the national public television a few times. It's all during 9-11. Then after that, uh, local television, ABC, NBC, CNN, have been covering. Anytime there is a, a disaster anywhere, somehow they call me, and uh, I go there talk about it. About two years ago, it's a funny story. I was uh, driving to Ken, uh, Kentucky. On the road, I get a call. It was Sean Hannity called. And he said, there is some conflict going at the time. Can you get on the radio and talk about the issue? They had seen me before. And I said, well, I'm driving. He says, can you pull over in a small town or in a Starbucks and then uh, uh, talk from there. So there was no Starbucks. I was in Mount Vernon, Texas. There is no Starbucks there. So I drove inside the town, very nice town, and the library, somebody I know in the library you can go. So I walked into the library. This uh, lady was there at the front. Do you have a room someplace in the library that I can sit down and make the conversation? She says, what radio? I said, Sean Hannity. Her eyes opened up. So she said, there is a room upstairs. You go sit down and talk. I, read it. I bought a hat when I was in Australia. I was a speaker at uh, Parliament of World Religions. I bought a, one of those hats. And I love wearing that hat, especially when it is raining. So I go sit in this big room with a big hat. And I had my, my uh, laptop, my camera, all the wires connected. So we were on the air, I was talking with Hannity on the radio. Brigitte Gabriel was my other person. She has a habit of speaking very loud. And I had to match that. We were talking about terrorism. And she and I were going against each other loudly. And all of a sudden there was a pin drop silence. I heard the third sound. I looked. All the ladies from the library, the managers were all standing. I looked at them. I started screaming, stop it! You are talking about terrorism. We don't know who you are. Stop it! They were scared. And I said, what's, what's the issue? 
I'm on the radio. They didn't say anything. So I continued back. Sean here. I said, what was going on? They said, nothing, Sean. So we went back to the radio. Then a few minutes later, I hear a big foot walking in. And there it was. I looked up. The police chief of Mount Vernon was there to arrest me with the handcuffs. He said, I'm here to arrest you. I said, what for? And I said, uh, uh, you were talking about terrorism. What is all these gadgets here? And uh, I've never seen any guy like you wearing a hat. I, I look funny. They had never seen anything in that town in non-white. They have seen African-American, but they had not seen anything like me. So then I said, wait a minute, dude. I was, um, so I had to hang up on the radio. And I said, I was with Sean Hannity. So was that you, dude? I was driving and listening to Sean Hannity. Was it you? I said, yes. I started laughing. And I took pictures and wrote a blog about it. So, but once you know each other, a lot of these things, after that, Sean Hannity and I have been on his program for about, I think about 45 times I have been on his TV. On TV, usually it is a seven minute segment. Just on Monday night, it was uh, Mitt Romney was there, and uh, Newt Gingrich, then uh, Santoro, right after that, me and uh, the other lady, Bridget, were there. It was a busy night. So uh, I was at one time I was among these top 30 guests because he would call me on any issue, whether it is pluralism, politics, or foreign affairs, or religion, or even Islam. He would call me on those issues. So that's how I have been on the TV, radio, and uh, thank God, uh, Huffington Post, which is the second largest web news paper in the world and I have been on it and almost they're publishing more than I wanted. I wanted to do once a month. Now I'm doing two to three articles a month on the issues that we face as a nation every day. At Dallas Morning News I write every week on pluralism. You can pick up anything out of the hundred some articles. Maybe there are one or two that did not focus on any religion or one might have focused on Islam. That was last week. But all the other 96, you can read through it, the article weaves through Hinduism, Islam, Jainism, Native Americans, Judaism. Uh, pluralism is, it's, we are not one people. Vasudeva uh, Kutumbakam, that's the whole concept. As one people, I want us, everybody to feel they are part of this story. So every article has something about it. And uh, I'm continuing with what I learned from my dad. Uh, every week, if there is a festival, Janmashtami, uh, Ram Nami, uh, Pariyoshana, Rosh Hashanah, Christmas, Ramadan, I write the essence. Not what the rituals, but the essence. Why do we celebrate Janmashtami, or Milad, or Ramadan, Christmas? What does it mean for a person who is not religious? So we can learn about each other and respect the otherness of other. So that's what proves, that's how I have been on the television. And uh, I'm going to be more on TV and uh, radio. So, uh, where do you go from here now? Where do I go from here? Pluralism is very critical in America. Right now with politics, there was a beautiful share poetry uh, someone had recited some years ago. So when there is a conflict between India and Pakistan, first find out if there are elections. If there are elections, politicians create the conflicts. In America, nothing different. Right now with the elections going on, politicians want to gain support from their base and they tell things that really don't make any sense. Uh, just to give you an example, since I'm from India, let's relate with the issues, India related issues. In November last year, 2011, in Kentucky, one of the Indians opened a new factory, creating 275 jobs. So when he had the uh, excuse me, I said earlier, Bhumi Puja. Yeah, when in the Kentucky, when the he had the Bhumi Puja done, the governor of the state of Kentucky came and some other people. And the governor obviously wore pajama and t-shirt and put the tilak. And all of a sudden, some of the senators 
and I'm a Republican, but the Republican senators, some of them were extremists. He started saying bad things about Hinduism and calling the governor names that he went to this polytheist, idolatrous thing. It offended me. What does he know about Hinduism to talk about it? And then, uh, so I wrote an article in uh, Huffington Post, standing up for Hindus, what I call, standing up for Jews, standing up for Muslims. So I'm gathering up articles, comments from everyone. I'm going to go see that Senator, Senator Williams in Kentucky. Sit down with him and explain to him what Hinduism is. If you talk something about some religion, learn about it, not from the bad guys, from the good guys, from the people who know about the religion. Then uh, Pastor Jeffress, right here in Dallas. Again, I want to very be clear here. We cannot stereotype anybody, meaning it's not Hindus, it's not Muslims, it's not Baptists. Individuals are bad, never the religion, never the group. So Pastor Jeffress happens to be a Baptist, but there are more good Baptists than him. He was, when he introduced Rick Perry for the government, he called Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Mormonism, cults. Something inferior in his mind. In Dallas he did something like that. So I get engaged in that. So we are creating an organization called American Together Foundation. And thank God Sean Hannity has been promoting. Uh, right after the show I'm looking at various newspapers. It's all there, America Together. Um, please, that I'm getting so much recognition not me, my organization. The simple goal of America Together Foundation is to create a society where no one, no American, 312 of us, be afraid of the other. That is the ideal society we all need to create. Our constitution supports us. Martin Luther King says, said that. One of the nicest sayings by one of the Native American chiefs, he says, we didn't create this earth. Man did not create this. This was created by someone else, the plants, life, humans, animals. We all live together. We all coexist. We are interdependent and dependent. And we cannot live by ourselves. We need all of these things for us to survive. If you mess with one of these strands in the web, we are messing the whole web. That's such a beautiful saying. So taking that saying, I'm making a documentary called America Together, Americans Together. How do we create a society where none of us have to be afraid, suspicious of each other? I have interviewed many of them. And then uh, I'm also going to be interviewing many presidential candidates. And uh, the, the documentary will be out. And you also mentioned about uh, articles. I have written over 1,000 articles so far, published all over the world, including, uh, I wrote an article, How to be Happy. Tehran Times published, in Indonesia they have published it. So articles and two books are coming up, one is on pluralism and one is about Americans together to build a better America. So these are the books, the television thing is going on there, and the organization will have, that was my dream, my dream, to bring the organization. In the organization, our advisory board will have from atheist to Zoroastrian, everyone in between. Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, uh, from every ethnicity, from women, civil groups. It is an organization where all Americans come together and create a society that's good for all of us. So that's where I'm headed to. That's what I'm working on. Right uh, we Thank you, were man. happy to know a lot about you and what good you have been doing to our community in uh, North America and uh, thank you very much. Well thank you, thank you Manohar, thank you Krishna for doing this program. This way our folks, the Desi folks can get to know about other places that have been in the town for a long time. Maybe some other time I'll tell the stories how we all began here. But I'm so pleased to be here and thank you so much for doing this and uh, Jai Ho to Desi TV. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.